Our second scripture reading this morning is from the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. You may recall that we read a story from this chapter last week, the story of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, suddenly waylaid by a flash of light and finding a new purpose in life. This story is a little different. It's not about Saul of Tarsus anymore. It's a story about Simon Peter, who in the previous story had just been instrumental and helping a man who had been paralyzed for seven years to stand and walk. Our story picks up in a different town. Listen for the word of God. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all outside. Then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and all the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. This ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God of grace, as we hear this stunning story, as we join that bedside, as we discover what you were up to with the early church. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing in our midst. Amen. Last week during our prayers, you heard Hayes mention Uh, the family of Rachel Held Evans, who had died at age 37. Rachel Held Evans was a writer, known mostly not just for her books and articles, but also for her fascinating Twitter feed, and she had quite a following. She was a woman who had come out of the uh, conservative evangelical church tradition and had had reached a place where she affirmed the ministry of women, where she affirmed the inclusion of the LGBTQIA community, and she spoke out very strongly for that. And as such, she was always in this kind of constant struggle with her former evangelical conservative churchmates. And eventually she she joined the Episcopal Church and became not just a, a... She did like to poke the bear. I will will give you that. She liked to say things that she knew would draw a reaction. But she said things that were wise, and she always erred on the side of making sure that we were as inclusive with our grace as God is with God's grace. And because of the kind of self-disclosing nature of her tweets and her books and articles, you really felt like you knew her as a friend if you were someone who followed her and and read her works. So when Rachel Held Evans died a week ago yesterday after battling an infection, it really came as quite a blow, particularly to a lot of female clergy for whom she was a very significant, strong voice, particularly to a lot of LGBTQ persons and their allies who also want the church to be more inclusive and open And it was quite a blow. And then we found out this week that a man named Jean Vanier died. Now, he was not 37 years old. It was not an untimely death. He was 90 years old. He had a tremendous life. Jean Vanier was the founder of an organization called L'Arche, the Ark. 
in French. And it was an organization that he began when he went to uh, an institution for people who are mentally disabled. And he saw how they were treated 24-7 as patients, as clients. And he just began to imagine what would life be like for them if instead of living entirely as a client or a patient, they lived as family. And so he bought a house and he got permission for two of the men who were in that institution to come and live with him. And they began to just live together as a family. And, and it wasn't without its challenges. They really did have some mental disabilities. But they also had things to contribute. And, he, and through it all, he learned th what it's like to, to be in community with someone who has always lived as an outsider. So he began to call his community the Ark, La Arche. And he, uh, he established different versions of it in 38 different states. And throughout the world, there are people who look at Jean Vanier as somebody who redefined for them what it is to be in community and family with people with mental disabilities. When someone like a Rachel Held Evans or a Jean Vanier dies, it, it's really a blow to the Christian community. And I share that with you so that you'll get a sense of what's going on in this city of Joppa that we read about today when this disciple named Tabitha, or Dorcas, had died. And in the Christian church, we, we tend to try to memorialize those who have died, and, and sometimes we do so by calling them saints. And it's not really a tradition we, we do a lot in the Protestant church, but it's been one that the church has done throughout the years. They would take someone whose life is significant and symbolic, and they would remember them as a saint, and they would develop an icon. A friend of mine took a sabbatical. He's a Lutheran pastor down in San Clemente. took a sabbatical to study iconography for a summer over in England. And he learned a lot of different things. First of all, there's a right way to draw Mark if you're drawing St. Mark of the Gospel. Because Mark is not Matthew. And you might think, but we don't know what any of them look like. But there is a right way to draw Mark and Matthew and John and all the saints. And there are right symbols to put with them. And there's a correct posture for them to be holding in the portrait. And they hold their hands differently. And if you've got Mark holding Matthew's hands, well, you just don't know your iconography there, you know. And, and, and they would shame you for that, right? And I discovered that you don't draw an icon, you don't paint an icon. You might use paint, you might use pencils, but you write an icon. So, there's an iconographer. His name is Reagan O'Callaghan, who does icons. Only instead of doing icons of saints who have been canonized by the church, he does icons of ordinary people the guy that's always sitting on the side of the road that greets everybody as they go by into Starbucks in the morning. He'll do an icon of him and make it all about his graciousness, his friendliness. He'll do an icon of a teacher and have her holding a piece of chalk instead of the symbols that one might find in other iconography. It's an amazing thing. And what he says he shoots for is he wants to see that divine spark in everybody and to memorialize that in an icon. And he calls it the sainthood of all believers. Isn't that a great phrase? The sainthood of all believers. We have a hard time with that, not only because we're Protestants and we don't really do saints, but because we, we also tend to focus on the heroes and focus on the notorious, the famous. We've got folks in California who are famous just for the sake of having been famous. I mean, tell me one thing Paris Hilton has contributed to society and we all know her name. That offends me that I know who this person is. There are people out there who have done marvelous things. I couldn't tell them from the hole in the wall, but I know her. 
I know that entire family that lives up in Malibu, and they've never done anything that added an inch to my life. We have this way of just kind of following the rich, the famous, the, 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 the notable, the beautiful, and all of that one. And what that does is when we read the scriptures, sometimes it prohibits us from seeing the real power of the story. So with the sainthood of all believers in mind, let's go back and revisit this story in Joppa that we've read from the book of Acts. Because it's easy to see it as a story about St. Peter. And, and admittedly, it is. I mean, he was instrumental in helping a woman who had been dead come back to life. That's not something I can put on my resume for the last couple of weeks. I don't know about the rest of you. So it is a St. Peter story. And if we put this story within the arc of his life, it's an impressive story because we knew him. We've seen him in the Gospels as this kind of bumbling, babbling braggart who thought he would never deny Jesus and turned around and did it three times. So we've seen Jesus and uh, we've seen Simon Peter as a stumbler, more or less. And yet here he is in this story. So yes, indeed, it is a story about Simon Peter and it's an admirable story about Simon Peter. But it's not just a story about Simon Peter. It's also a story about a person who is unknown to us outside of this small paragraph in the book of Acts. And she's hardly known to us in this paragraph. But we learn some significant things about her. Her name is Tabitha which is also given to us by the narrator in Greek as Dorcas. Both names translate to the word gazelle. She's known for, a, a, a lot of biblical scholars refer to her as a matriarch in Joppa. If we read the story, she, we don't really know her age. It may be that they're brokenhearted because she died young and uh, in an untimely way. But she is surrounded by the widows. And when Peter comes into the room where they had cleaned and laid her body, they begin to show him these tunics and fabrics that, that uh, Dorcas had made. And she's described as someone who's known for her alms giving. As a result of that, we often imagine that perhaps she was wealthy. So we may have someone who's a, a, a wealthy textile merchant who, rather than simply adding to her wealth, is constantly giving uh, tunics and, and robes and clothing, particularly to those who are poor. Now, we have to speculate a little bit because the, the details are kind of small. But this is, this is the Dorcas who had died. And one thing that's unique about this text is it is the only place where the feminine form of the word disciple is found in the New Testament. And that's how she's introduced. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. She's one of those folks. She's part of that sainthood of all believers. She's that person we'll never hear from again in the book of Acts. We just know that her disposition and her giving her gifts, her talents that she shared in Joppa made it such that when she died, the church was devastated. And the church has always been this institution that's had its talking heads and it's had its notable figures and those folks who are elevated as saints and remembered and their names appear on buildings and so forth. But, but that's never really been the lifeblood of the church. The lifeblood of the church has always been the sainthood of all believers. <coughs> Folks like you checking on a neighbor who might otherwise be neglected. Nobody knows it and you don't ask for credit. Folks like you who scan the room and see somebody who looks relatively new and you make sure that somebody at least has spoken to them before it's time to go. Folks like you who scrap and work hard. It's like that great mega church that once only survived and paid the light bill because the quilting group got together and brought their quilts and sold them at an auction 
and kept it going. And years later, when it becomes a mega church and everything's beautiful, people might smirk that they have a quilting group. But you forget that once upon a time, this is precisely the kind of work that it takes. Just like that famous doctor who first learned that science is a beautiful thing from an underpaid middle school science teacher. Long forgotten, perhaps, but altogether important. That's the sainthood of all believers. That little small role that each of us plays, whether it's writing a check, whether it's showing up, whether it's extending a hand, whether it's offering to pull, push, or make something happen. The sainthood of all believers. And when you leave this place today, I invite you to walk in the glory of being that kind of a saint. And I want to leave you with the words from our friend Jean Vanier, who once said, Let us not put our sights too high. We don't have to be saviors of the world. We are simply human beings, enfolded in weakness and hope, called together to change our world one heart at a time. Thanks be to God. Amen.